welcome you this morning uh, to our technical briefing on the release of our reports of the World Trade Center uh, 7 investigation, um, which we uh, started in right earnest three years ago uh, after having completed our investigation of uh, the uh, World Trade Center towers and had issued the final reports from that investigation. My name is Sham Sundar. I'm the director of the Building and Fire Research Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and I'm also the lead investigator for the investigation. I'd be happy to take uh, more questions. Let me come back to uh, James Gourley's question from uh, earlier in the uh, briefing. Uh, his question was, did NIST test any WTC-7 debris for explosives or incendiary chemical residues? Well, uh, with regard to alternative hypothesis, I think I need to point out very uh, clearly that when we started the investigation, we considered a whole range of possible hypotheses. And from that, based on our technical judgment, we decided what were credible hypotheses that we should pursue further. Uh, among them, of course, was the uh, fuel oil fire, diesel fuel fire, uh, the transfer girders, uh, the role of the transfer girders, uh, uh, and there, of course, the, the most obvious, which is the, the normal building fires or the building fires, uh, the conventional uh, building fires of the fires that we talked about this morning. Uh, in addition to that, because of the uh, uh, concern expressed by several people about uh, blasts and blast blast-oriented sounds, we decided to include that as a hypothetical uh, scenario to also evaluate. We judged that other hypotheses that were suggest, possible hypotheses that were suggested really didn't, were not credible enough uh, to uh, justify an invest, you know, a careful investigation. Um, with regard to the issue of the residue, uh, there's, there's a reference often made to a piece of steel from Building 7 uh, that uh, is documented in the earlier FEMA report uh, that deals with some kind of a residue that was found, sulfur-oriented residue, uh, and in fact that was found by uh, a professor who a professor who was then at the uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, Professor Jonathan Barnett. Uh, but that the piece of steel has been subsequently analyzed um, by uh, Dr. Bar Professor Barnett and by Professor Rick Sisson was also from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and they reported in a BBC uh, um, interview that uh, aired on July 6th that there was no evidence that any of the residue in that steel, in that piece of steel, uh, had any uh, relationship to uh, uh, an, an, an undue uh, fire event in the building, or any other kind of incendiary device in the building. The uh, next question uh, comes from uh, Dr. Stephen Jones. Uh, did NIST have available to it samples of dust from the WTC catastrophe? And if so, did NIST examine the dust for red or gray chips? As I said uh, uh, just a moment ago, we, uh, we, we went through a pretty rigorous screening process to figure out which were the credible hypotheses that we would pursue um, and, uh, and, and, and how we went about pursuing them. Uh, we did not believe that uh, the, the, uh, the possible hypothesis that you just mentioned uh, fell into the realm of a credible hypothesis. And of course, with any of these alternative theories that we did not consider, the most important uh, factor was none of them had a coherent theory as to what actually happened on 9-11. They were just isolated anecdotes, pieces of information, that really don't stand together in some kind of a meaningful fashion. The uh, next question comes again from uh, Lori Van Auken of the September 11th Advocates. The question is, if building materials typically supply fuel to a fire for 20 minutes and the insulation used on the columns, including column 79, lasts for two to three hours, how did column 79 fail? What fueled the fire for that long? That's a good question. Um, and of course, uh, keep in mind that the um, 20, 20 to 30 minutes is the time it takes for a combustible in a particular location to start igniting and then complete the process of 
completely burning out. But that combustible may be a table. Um, it may be a uh, filing cabinet. It may be a, a, a computer workstation. It can be a, a furniture, uh, chairs, uh, and paper, and so on. So th this is not as though the entire space is all burning concurrently. It is each combustible burns for 20 to 30 minutes. And of course, when you look at column 79 and the 2,000 square feet of floor area around column 79, uh, you can have fires moving from combustible to combustible in that vicinity for a long time. So it moves around. And as you saw the simulation uh, show it, uh, it does take a long time. It's, it's just that each combustible takes 20 to 30 minutes to burn, not the entire floor. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you have the full combustible burning, temperatures can actually go to much higher temperatures in the steel. And, uh, and of course, the phenomenon that we saw in 9-11 that brought this particular building down was really thermal expansion, which occurs at lower temperatures. So we had lower temperatures, you know, you had lower temperatures, uh, you know, gas that was still coming, that it was heating up. So you had temperatures rising even before the combustible started uh, burning a lot in a location. And once the combustible had already burned, the room doesn't go to room temperature instantaneously. It takes a long time for that heat and the temperature to actually dissipate. So there's a lot of uh, heat that's in the room. And the 20 to 30 minutes is just uh, for each combustible. The uh, next question comes from Mindy Kleinberg, also of the September 11th Advocates. If column 79 collapsed and then 80 and 81, all of which were on the same side, why wasn't the collapse asymmetrical? Well, um, keep in mind that what you, the only view you had of the building, uh, m video view you had that was any uh, clear and, uh, and visible and where you could actually make out what was happening were from the north of the building. So what was happening? Uh, behind the north facade was not visible to you, to anyone from uh, the north view. And uh, what you would see happening is that when column 79, 80, and 81 collapsed in, in sequence, that you would have internal failures that were asymmetrical, internal to the building, uh, which would not be visible from outside the building. And then when you have the progression of failures from east to west, you again would have a progression internal to the building Keep in mind that the interior of the building had columns uh, that were uh, had with connections that were not moment resisting. They were simple connections. These columns were kind of what they're called leaning columns or standalone columns with the floor floors kind of holding them in place. The exterior wall, on the other hand, was a moment resisting frame. So it's a much more stable structure, and it's not going to fail easily. So. When you see what you see from the outside is really is the exterior of the building, which you don't see anything happening. But if you look through uh, the videos very carefully, and we have done them in many, many, uh, uh, for over many, many hours, you do see hollowing out of uh, materials behind the windows. You see, uh, um, you know, air gaps show up and so forth as, as the collapse starts to, to start from the south, north, uh, from the top to the bottom. The uh, next question is uh, from Lori Van Auken. Did NIST interview Larry Silverstein to find out why he said there was so much loss of life we decided to pull it regarding WTC7? No, we did not uh, interview uh, Larry Silverstein. And let me uh, kind of explain why we do that, why we, we, we did not do that. Um, the, we are a technical scientific investigation. So what we place the most uh, importance on, credence on, are the scientific facts to, to the extent that we can get them. And of course, what helps us most in this re complex reconstruction are the things I just, I just mentioned this morning. One is we want to get documents, uh, documentary evidence, that is plans, specifications, uh, um, Structural plans, architectural plans, connection, uh, framing, uh, you know, detailed fabrication drawings, and so on. We then look for visual information. Again, uh, information from photographs and videos that actually tell us what actually happened on 9/11. We then do try and go in depth and talk to people 
who actually were in charge of emergency response the, on the site. Um, and we, we, we go and talk to people who, uh, who, who may, in the case of the towers, who are actually occupants of the building. So again, we do that not by just anecdotal conversation. We actually do it in a very structured format where the information we obtain from that analysis uh, is, can be useful to make robust findings and then conclusions and recommendations. So that's how we approach this investigation. What people say, you know, what they said on TV, uh, why they say it, when they say it, for us is really uh, the least uh, important uh, from the point of view of trying to carry out a scientific investigation. I will point out that the, uh, the term pull it is an expression that is often used uh, in the fire service community uh, when you decide not to, uh, to uh, do any further work uh, in, a, in a building uh, which is subjected to an emergency. So it's not an unusual term. Um, but uh, again, what was said doesn't really matter. What happened really matters. And we have the science behind our findings and recommendations, and that's important. This next question comes from Dr. Stephen Jones. Uh, NIST discusses the fall time for WTC-7 on page 40 of the summary report, where uh, it stated, assuming that the descent speed was approximately constant. However, observations uh, by others of the descent speed show that the building is accelerating uh, rather than uh, being at constant speed. Uh, so the question is, why did NIST assume that the descent speed was approximately constant? Well, the, um, I'm going to have uh, John Gross to answer that as question as soon as he's ready. But the most important thing is this was a gravitational force. So gravitation is a force of acceleration. So I will have uh, John uh, clarify what, what we said. Yeah, the um, force of gravity obviously is uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is uh, what's uh, at the driving force. And uh, uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that um, uh, time was uh, established from the um, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, uh, search of the, of the uh, time, so that was down to 1 30th of a second. Uh, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. So, uh, Steve, can you repeat that question? What is it that is being asked here? Let me, let me go back to it. The, the question was, why did we report descent speed rather than acceleration? The, uh, the statements in the report uh, has to do with um, the uh, assuming that the descent speed is constant. Well, the, the descent speed is not constant. Obviously, it goes from zero at the initial to um, uh, a later speed. We didn't. We computed the uh, the time that it takes to uh, drop the roughly uh, 18 stories that were in view. We also provided a calculation based on the distance from the top of the parapet to the um, lowest point visible to compare that with the freefall speed. So I guess, w w is there a sentence there that There's explicitly, some, they, me, what, does exp what does the sentence mean? Fahim, can you clarify that? Uh, I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. Thank you for pointing that uh, out to us, because that probably needs uh, fixing. The uh, next question is again from uh, Lori Van Auken. Uh, many people who were near WTC7 on 9-11 did hear explosions. Some even heard a countdown on the police radio. Uh, did you speak with these people? 
Uh, no, we did not speak with those people, again, for the same reason I just mentioned, so I won't repeat the whole argument, which is that the science speaks for itself, and it's pretty robust. Now, with regard, I do have some comments with regard to uh, 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 sounds that relate to booms or explosive sounds and so forth. There are many things that can cause sounds in a building, um, particularly in a situation that we were on 9-11. Uh, we can have uh, pieces of the building, uh, facade, collapse, fail. Uh, we can have uh, interior uh, connections because of fire, damage, and uh, cause a, cr a sound that is uh, pretty sudden in nature, which may sound like uh, an explosion uh, or, uh, or and so forth. Uh, and, of course, there are uh, heavy mechanical equipment, as, you, as we heard. We, uh, we heard about diesel generators and uh, fuel tanks and uh, so forth on these... Uh, different uh, floors, uh, and they can, of course, uh, uh, you know, have a partial settlement, collapse, uh, and so forth that can cause uh, sounds that appear to sound like explosions. Uh, it is important to know that if, you, if any one of those people who were in the building when they heard explosive sounds, uh, it's likely that they would not have survived if, in fact, it was an explosion that, that actually brought the building down. because. Um, if, in fact, it was an explosion that brought the building down, the entire building would come down on them, and they wouldn't sur be survived to really tell the tale uh, that they did on 9-11. So clearly, uh, the sounds they heard, the fact that they were able to escape, and then later on uh, report on the sounds they heard, suggest that they were events, but they were not the ones that actually brought the building down at 5.20 that afternoon. Um, so we have... Uh, Exactly uh, 15 seconds left, uh, and I think based on uh, based on the fact we have now 10 seconds left, that would be all the questions we can really take for this morning. I really appreciate all of you for um, participating. I just want you to know that the uh, public comment period is open through the uh, 15th of September at noon. So again, you can submit that. The instructions are available on our website. Thank you very much.